So welcome to the first. This is the first time we've done RN and PN together for HESI Review. And why did I do that? Well, this is the first semester that I did teach the PN and the RN together. Oh, wow. And what I, I found, like Mommy. what I found is the topics are absolutely the same. And what you're both looking for is the same. There's little differences between what RNs and PNs do. So I thought it would be a great thing to do. So let's see if it works. Uh, I think you both can help each other. And very honestly, who taught me how to be a nurse? A lot of PNs, okay? PNs were my little guardians who helped me through when I started. So I'll always have the deepest, you know, you know, gratitude. So that's why I did it also. Okay, let's go to this, um, let me pull it up. That's what I didn't do on this one. Let's pull up your outline and let's look at um, these things going down and down. There are, as I said, 20 things and under them are a lot of different subcategories. And I think that um, doing it that way, I have given you um, a, a broad understanding of GI or GU, et cetera. So here's your outline. All right, let me put it down and let me share you now. So oh, can everybody see the review? Topics yes. to cover for HESI review. All right. All right. Well, the one thing I think all of you have heard me talk about is nutrition, nutrition, and nutrition. And we know that it's important. Why? Why is nutrition an issue? What if we don't get enough? Number one, what do you see? Now, this is going to be open back and forth. You need to talk to me, okay? So in nutrition, let's say an infant, brand new baby's not getting enough. What could happen? What's going to happen to their growth? Oh, delay. 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 Develop. And cognitive or development delays. And how would we know that or see it? Well, what do we do every time we go into a doctor's office or urgent care ER? We weigh these children and get a height on them. That's guaranteed. Also, if a kid's not turning over completely by six months, now we've caught them within six months of life, something's going on. Now, let's look at the older child. Like I said here with IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, that means their bowels are not absorbing the nutrients the way they should. So let's think about what that diagnosis is and what does it mean? Well, in older children, um, it's still going to make a difference because if you don't feed the body, the body is not going to think properly. And again, there's going to be some delays there. So always in nutrition, when a problem with nutrition, if a child's not getting what they want, and yes, there's going to be delays somehow, some way, and they will be picked up. You know, the good thing about nutrition is you can catch it up. And as long as it's caught early, that's why we had to learn all that growth and development and stuff, right? Now, nutrition and GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease of an infant. Well, that's not a bad thing, right? They're just spitting up a little bit. Well, what are they doing when they're spitting up? They're losing nutrition. So how do we hold it in? Well, there's a couple of things we can do. As we're feeding the child, what do we feed them? Well, we put that little bit of rice cereal thick in it. But what else are we going to teach these parents to do while feeding these children? Burp them, uh, supplement. Burp uh, them a supplement lot. formula. Okay. Uh, don't don't overfeed them. We're going to make sure that they're burnt well. Somebody's trying to talk and the internet's really squeaky like robot man. So another thing we do is have them sit up after we feed them for at least 30 minutes, okay? Sitting them up, he keeps it down. 
that rice cereal keeps it down and then not overfeeding them and then making sure that they're well burped. And that's going to save nutrition because remember what they do in that first year of life. They double their weight at six months. They triple it at one year. And it's not quadrupled to about two and a half years old. So that first year is very important. Now, what if you have a child who is obese? Okay. So how do we you know, evaluate that? How do we evaluate that child is obese? And how do we, what do we do? How do we go and ask the parents? And you can see here. We're going to go. Will we back. check their BMI. Well, of course, absolutely. You're going to check their BMI. We're going to see what is their number because we know normal numbers are like low teens, right? Like, you know, about 15, 20 is like fine. 30, you're starting to get overweight. And after that, they're saying that you are overweight and should lose weight. Now, we don't need to know those numbers, but we know if somebody is 60% you know, BMI, you know, we know there's a problem, right? You know, when you're talking about the surface area and the body and, you know, how fat they are according to weight and height. Now, it is said to go back and look at three-day history of their diet. Three-day history, not a 24-hour diary like we would do in older children. Like adolescents, that's what you're taught. You're going to do more of a three-day history. And that history is going to tell you what's the problem. And then are they uh, up and are they out and are they moving or are they on video games? And are they active at school? You know, some schools have PE and some don't have them anymore. So that might be the only activity they get if they're at school. It could be an environmental, you know, where they live that they can't go outside. And that is a real factor. Okay, you're a nurse at the hospital on nutrition. You have a child with celiac disease. Well, number one, what do you avoid with celiac disease? I know. What do you know? Milo. Gluten. Gluten, right. What is gluten? What sort of wheat and rice and oats, right? And barley. It's all of the flours we use for almost everything. Could be that macaroni and cheese. It's that uh, breaded chicken fingers, uh, French toast, pancakes, all of that is something that they really have to avoid unless it's a rice flour and they have that out now. So you get a child who's getting, you know, let's say they sent up a, a diet and on there there's crackers. Well, you're going to take that off the tray, right? So as a nurse, don't assume that dietary knows what they're giving children and what could hurt them because children sometimes will just eat it, right? So we're going to be removing things from the tray. Be aware of those. Thrush, what is it? What do you see? Um, why White yeah. yeah. And you can't scrape them off no matter what you do. It's not like a little milk sitting there. It's sitting there. How do we treat thrush? Nystatin. Right, which is nystatin, yes. Now, when an infant has thrush, it hurts. It does, it, and it's swollen, the tongue and, and the gums, et cetera. So treat it again so they can get nutrition. So do you see how just simple thrush can affect nutrition? Now, diaper rash. This is a big thing in infants. You know, one of the things with diaper rash is uh, it hurts. And it hurts because why? They're sitting in urine and stool, correct? How would we have a child sleep at night? Because we want them to sleep all night long, right? We want to be able to sleep and they want to be able to sleep. And if not, you're both cranky. So how are you going to treat diaper rash to get that child to sleep most of the night? What a topical ointment. Some sort of ointment, a protective barrier. Yes, Belinda, very good. It could be something like zinc. Oil. It could be zinc. It could be any what you know, whatever that can sit and be thick and sit on there and protect the skin from urine, which is acidy, right? And stool, which is alkaline, burning the butt, or else this kid's gonna be awake all night long. In fact, one of the first signs of a diaper rash before sometimes you even know it is they're not sleeping at night because they're awake crying because their butts hurt, right? I would, if my butt hurt, if I was excoriated like that. So protecting it properly. Now we know nutrition the first six months is only um, 
giving either breast milk or iron fortified formula. Now at six months, how do we start introducing foods and what would be a good food to introduce first? Rice and um, Rice once at a time. And how much should we wait in between? Four to seven days. Four to seven days, right. Rice cereal, and why do we do rice cereal first? It's the least allergen I, um, allergenic of all the foods. It's the one that most people tolerate without any um, difficulty with, whether it is stomach issues, whether rashes, um, all of those discomforts. So it usually goes down easy. I mean, why do you think we put it in that infant cereal for GERD? Now, they're not getting nutrition from it because the, the intestines is not ready for it, but it holds the food down. So it's done its purpose. You've gotten your nutrition because of it. So yes, one food at a time. Usually start with the rice cereal is a great one to start with. Wait four to seven days and introduce the next food and one at a time. Okay. Infants. Let's go to some little key things about infants and you know some of the ages here. So infants, you see um, at morning you know, or whenever you come in, you do an assessment. And one of the things we do is we do head circumference, chest circumference, abdominal circumference. And usually if we give them a bath, we'll weigh them. It's all just part of the assessment. Now you were off for three days, you come back and you got your little baby boy back that you fell in love with, of course. And you notice that head circumference has gone up two inches. What's the next thing are you going to look at before you do anything? What shows you increase the fontanelles? In the fontanelles. fontanelles. I was check. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Fontanelles are great. And when they're there, I mean, infants can't talk to you. They could be whiny, crying, showing you they're hurting or something. But that fontanelle can show you dehydration, sunken in very easily. And we all can see it bulging. And that's at rest sitting, bulging fontanelle. So absolutely. Good. Remember, infants are self-soothers and they soothe it through their mouth, even through up into toddler preschoolers. Everything in their mouth, they explore the world. So remember, you have a child who's born with something like uh, esophageal atresia or tracheal uh, fistula. They can't eat because everything goes right in the lungs. Now, remember, normal growth and development, they need to self-soothe, right? They're mm -hmm. getting, you know, nutrition in an IV of some sort. So that pacifier, very important. Don't forget it. It's a priority, actually. Now, I've seen many parents come in and say, you know, my kid was six months old, was already sitting, you know, and this kid is different. It's not sitting yet. You know, what, what's going on here? What would you tell a parent like that? One kid is different than the other. One was further ahead. What's happening? There's something wrong with my kid? No. Well, you'd say, well, what time did, you know, how old is your kid when they first sat? Well, they were eight months old when they sat. Well, isn't that what the books say? Sitting unsupported is eight months old. So remember, every infant, every child develops at a different rate of whatever. As I've even said uh, all along, I have had um, some friends, their kids are walking at seven, eight months. And my children, even my grandson, they never walk they ran at 15 months. Does that mean they're delayed? No, because they did everything else, okay? So that's something we can explain. And sometimes putting a personal touch into it will alleviate some of these parents' um, concerns. Remember toddlers, you know, we want to do a procedure. Number one, always number one, get on their level and don't sit above them, get on even their level you know, eye level, okay? And then developmental level. Let's start to play, right? Where's your ears? Where's your nose? Oh, I bet you tickle here. You know, get them comfortable. Then we can explain things and they're visual learners. They have to see this, most of these toddlers. So using a doll, using, you know, a teddy bear, using a something, where are we gonna be touching you? And I'm telling you, in toddlers, ages one to three, respond well when you let them see where your touch is going. 
and telling them before you touch them. They don't want to be surprised and they do understand at a very young, young age. Now, right after toddlers and going into school age, yes, we have preschoolers, but there is this time about two to three where all of a sudden, this is where we diagnose autism. And what is one of the key things you see with autism? Walking on their tippy toes. Walking on mm -hmm. their tippy toes, yes. I mean, I've told my students, I had my daughter's friend's uh, little girl right at the beginning of COVID. She's walking on her tippy toes. And they said, could you tell me what's wrong with her? And I'm like, uh, this kid's on the spectrum. They need help. And let me tell you, two years later, this kid is so much different because they got help. So yes, also that re repetitive, repetitive behaviors, as in taking a truck and putting it on a chair and taking a doll and putting it on top and taking a blanket and putting it there, taking the blanket off, the doll off, the truck off, and then doing it over, truck on, doll on, blanket on, over and over and over by themselves. They don't listen. They don't call, you know, come when you call their name. They don't like touch. They don't like lights. They don't like sounds. These are in the very beginning before we start any sort of therapies on them. This is what we try to work them out with therapy. And there is a modified checklist for autism that's out there. And it could sort of point us. And, you know, wherever you work, there's going to be some sort of thing, the tool they use. Sometimes they use the one that's, you know, generic, but sometimes many places have their own. So just be aware of that. So repetitive behaviors, and they don't, and usually speech delays and cognitive delays, right? They're going to be behind. School age children. Their height is decreasing and they're like on the lower spectrum now. What do you need to ask the parents about this? So they're fine. The, the percentage, they're in their proper percentage is growing up and all of a sudden they're getting a little bit shorter. See how tall the parents are? Absolutely. Well, what if the parents are only five foot tall, both of them? Do you expect a child to be six foot when they're growing up? No. It's one of the first things we look at, okay? Now, another thing we look at with that height decreasing, we're going to make sure are they cognitive where they should be, okay? Because remember, height, weight, cognitive, we worry about it. We worry about nutrition. So this would be the first thing we say. Well, how, how tall is your brothers and sisters? How tall is your mom and dad? You know, um, all of these things. Now, many times we have, of course, I mean, most people have more than one child and one kid gets sent to the hospital and it could be for a longer period of time. So how do you deal with those siblings that are home when their brother or sister is in the hospital and they can't get in to see them? I mean, this was really rampant during COVID. Can you imagine the, the angst, the... Like, what's going on? Is my brother dying in the hospital? He's been there, okay? How would you make those siblings feel like their brother was okay? Besides FaceTime, of course, other stuff. Um, letters, sending letters. Absolutely. Family picture. Color picture, color picture, oh. right. Or maybe I made bows for that little girl. Maybe she has a sister at home. Make one for my sister. You know, there's little things, and you think they're little, but I'm telling you, they're huge. Make those siblings at home feel like their brother or sister's not dying. Because remember what kids think. They think you're punished by God, when the, you know, and maybe their brother's being punished by God and they're going to die. This is the way kids think, those preschoolers, right? How old is that child who's at home? Okay, adolescents, you know, going to the hospital, you know, let's say they have some sort of congenital heart disease or they have, you know, something that they're chronically in and out of the hospital. Now, adolescents, we worry about separation anxiety in the younger kids and hospitalizations, right? Well, adolescents, how are we going to fit into what their needs are? Are they just going to want mommy?
No, they're going to want from their friends. Right. So let's make up a, a little area where that child and friends can get together and everybody's safe, right? Like a kid who's sick, you sorry you can't come in or wear a mask if you don't have a fever for 24 hours. Actually, it's 24 hours. But yes, we want to do something to make that adolescent feel normal. You know, you know, we're sort of lucky today with this FaceTime stuff, but it's nothing like having your friend there next to you or friends. You know, some friend, adolescents have multitudes of friends. Okay, adolescents, we know they go through that pre-adolescent growth spurt. They start to go through puberty. And how do we know they're going through puberty? You know, first thing that happens in females, breast buds. First thing that happens to males is the enlarged testicles. Well, how do we know what stage they're in? It's all about tanners, and it's something that you need to look at prior to going into the HESI. Stage one, two, three, four, five. Where are they on that level? When, you know, puberty starts, it's about two years later that menses start. So that's telling you where they are and when to be prepared. So adolescents, we know that they can be sexually active. Um, and many of them, of course, don't. Dad, no. I think my mother would have locked me in my room for life. So they don't want mommy to know. Now, but this adolescent is asking you for help. I want to know about oral contraceptives. What can you tell that adolescent? You can give them written and oral information. Written and oral. That's exactly right. Because not your opinion. You can give what you know like manufacturers or, or information you have on it and maybe send them to you know Planned Parenthood or whatever is available for them to go get it so they can you know be safe I mean we can always say abstinence is number one they're not going to listen we can also say wear condoms if you are to protect yourself but still that's not contraceptive so I mean we could do all of those things but again make sure that we do um, give them oral and written Remember, Piaget is all about figuring out things. So it's all about, you know, your mind and how they process, okay? Uh, we know as learners, we're all different learners, right? And that's actually part of Piaget. You know, what sort of learner are you? Are you the visual, the auditory? I mean, who are you? Um, but we know that also it starts with infants. You know, as in the first thing we do is we grasp and we hear this rattle you know, rattle like, oh, I like that. And we do it again. This is part of learning, being aware and understanding. Um, object permanence is the first, one of the first things that happens. And objects permanence is what? When they know an object is there, but it's like hidden. Right. And it's really good to put it like behind something and they have to try to use their muscles, their you know, um, muscles and, and their mind to go creep, try to start to push themselves to get there. It's a really good thing during that tummy time area. Erickson, infants. What does Erickson say about infants? We know it's trust versus mistrust. What does that mean? their needs are being met is trust and okay if they're not like if the if they're crying and the parent doesn't come then that's mistrust it's absolutely that so their trust is because they know that they're fed they're changed they're held they're burped when some but when they need it okay and they know there are children for whatever reasons, abusive, you know, whatever sort of uh, households. It can be that, you know, maybe there's triplets, who knows? And this, this mother is only alone. They can't get to them quick enough. And it gets to the point where they stop crying because no one's gonna come. I mean, that's the extreme of the mistrust. School age. Now, school age, I think, is one that I've seen. NCLEX SESIs always love school age. They love infants and they love adolescents. That's why I hit those key three things, okay? Now, school age is all about 
I am the best speller in the whole school. I'm the best, you know, math kid. I can count and add up anything, but I can't kick a ball. I am terrible at coloring. So that's industry. And that's all about, uh, you know, the inability to do other stuff, right? So industry is what I do well. Now, how would we take that and use that in the hospital? You know, we'll have kids that are going to be longer stays and parents can't be there all the time. So we have so many resources with pediatric children, especially if you work in a pediatric hospital, you know, to keep them occupied. And maybe the child has this bad broken leg and, and can't or hip or whatever, can't get out of bed. We need to give something to do something that challenges them, but they're able to accomplish. So that's their industry. So you're challenging them, giving them a chore to do. So when they're done with it, they feel great. You don't want that inferiority feeling like, you know, I tried so hard, but I couldn't, I can't do this, right? That's what they do, I can't do this. We don't want to hear that. We're like, man, that was really hard, but I figured it out. Right? So industry, what they do well. And remember, adolescents are all about who am I? What do I look like? What am I going to be? And uh, I don't really want my parents around, right? This is the adolescent age. So remember, everything with any diagnosis that can alter their body image is going to be a big deal for your adolescence. For instance, scoliosis and that big brace, right? It alters body image. So think about any diagnosis that could create a body image problem that's going to affect your adolescence the yeah, most. Yeah, can one Xbox go let this or no? Because they are aware. Remember with adolescents, we can um, have them leave the room and talk to the adolescent alone to find out things. Uh, I think... Um, most adolescents, if again, we've broken up those ages that um, we, we sat there and we started to talk to them about social stuff and, you know, uh, the music they're listening to, what you want to be in school, and we've broken the ice, a lot of them will talk to you. And remember, you can tell them this is held in confidence. And the only way it's not is if it's going to hurt themselves or others, right? Because those are real fears. All right, let's start breaking down into some diagnoses. So what is hemophilia? What's the problem with hemophilia? Isn't it like your body, um, the clotting is not normal? Right. The clotting they, factors they bleed easily. are, right. They don't have all the things needed to make the blood clot and stop bleeding. So you keep bleeding, right. Absolutely. Now, what's the problem with that? All right, let's look at hemophilia. So they have a problem with bleeding. So if they get a cut or they get a bruise, which is bleeding, it could be a major problem if we don't treat it. Well, number one, how do you treat bleeding? Well, putting a finger on it's not going to help because they're still not going to clot, right? I mean, it might make you feel better, but it's that rice, just like ortho injuries. Raise it, ice it, contain it, elevate it. And if it's a bleeding issue on a known hemophiliac, they can give home therapy. Many of these uh, families either have the nasal sprays or the IV factors. And as you know, I've told my class, I've seen it given by a father that was as good as I could have done. And it was amazing uh, to watch. And I still remember that father. And he was so proud that I gave him those compliments. But, okay, so we know how to treat it when it happens, when we have the factors and we can do it. Because remember, we want to protect those joints. We don't want to say they fell down, got a knee injury. It's bleeding in that joint capsule. It's very caustic and it will destroy joint capsules. And these uh, children can become more wheelchair dependent as they get older. So that's what we want to prevent. Now, you've got a toddler just diagnosed with hemophilia. Well, what do we know about the dive bomb kids, right? 
they're doing everything. They're running, they're playing, there's no filter, they don't care. You know, we've got all, all of these things, these sharp corners on coffee tables. We have things that they can run by and bump and hit. You know, it's going to sound crazy, but safety at home is the key here. You know, if they have a sharp, you know, type of coffee table, go get one of those padded ones or pad the corners because it will cause injury. You're not going to stop them from running and playing, and you wouldn't want to do that. That's part of their exploration and the way they learn. Does that make sense, right? We want to protect them, so safety is always key. All right, nosebleed prevention. How do we do this? Well, a yeah, kid gets a nosebleed, spontaneous, or they were hitting the nose. We would just take the thumb and thorn finger, right? Lean forward, 10 minutes. Well, what happens if it doesn't stop after 10 minutes? Seek medical attention. Absolutely, because it could be something more. They might need to do surgery, cauterize it. Sometimes they do nasal tampons, they call it, which is basically like a tampon, just putting pressure on those little capillaries. There's all different things that might be done. Yes, and then that might be the first sign of things like ITP, right? Idiopathic thrombocytopenia purpura, which means P, platelets, low. It could be that first sign. So nosebleeds, you need to pay attention. It's just not a nosebleed. One is, but you have a second one, something's there, okay? So one of those alerts. Platelet counts are low. And it doesn't matter for whatever reason, you're in a hospital, you're looking at your morning labs on your patients, and this one patient has a platelet count of 15,000. What are you gonna do to protect that patient and why are you protecting? What does low platelets do? Would they go on bleeding precautions? Uh, there you go. Very good, Kayla. Yes, bleeding precautions. And that would mean no IM injections. You know, we're not going to try to do any needles anywhere. If we can stop from doing an IV insertion, yes. No razors. And we're going to be checking for nosebleeds, uh, soft toothbrushes, checking stools, checking urines. And again, if it's children, we're going to be protecting that area so that they're not going to be bumping into stuff because we will see them bruising and bleeding, et cetera. So remember, when you look at platelets, it's not just always the ITP type of concern. It could just be a patient. We know the, um, the leukemia children do get low platelets. It's just part of their process. But it doesn't have to be that. Remember, it could be any person. Sometimes platelets are low due to overwhelming sepsis. There's many reasons for it. Okay, sickle cell disease. I come in and I'm having severe pain in my left knee. What is your first course of treatment? Priority nursing care. Fluids. Fluids, fluids, yes. Why are we giving fluids first? We want to keep them hydrated. You want to keep them hydrated because those, what happens in sickle cell disease is the vessels become small and at bifurcation, so sickle cells get stuck and then blood can't go down and it swells causing pain and it could cause necrosis of tissue distally from that occlusion. So yes, it's painful. And you, many students think that pain's number one. Well, you're treating the symptom, not the cause. The cause is those vessels are small. So let's open vessels, fluid bolus, eat and elevate if you can. Beautiful, beautiful. So that's the reason why fluids are first. And of course, I'm going to have the pain medicine in the other hand as I'm starting that fluid bolus, but it's the fluid which is going to stop that pain because now we've treated the cause of it. So acute lymphocytic leukemia, we know that this is the uh, no white blood cells. 
um, there's no immune system on these children. And we are also giving them chemotherapy, which is wiping out I mean, many things in the blood. Um, it's going to decrease hemoglobins and matocrits and platelets. And, you know, it's going to just wipe out the cancer cells in there. So these children are sent home, you know, in between treatments. What's the one thing um, that if that parent saw they need to seek medical attention as soon as possible? What's that one thing that tells them there's something happening here. There's an infection. Something's going on. Remember, they don't have any defense at all. Fever. Fever. 100.5, they need to call their doctor because there's no immune system. And that little fever of 100.5 can become septic shock really quick. So getting them, I usually say go to the ER you know, and they'll access the port and they'll do lab works and they'll give them some, some IV antibiotics. So absolutely. And, you know, uh, children that are so immunosuppressed should be in their private room. Okay. We don't want to have any causative reason of another child um, giving them anything. And then iron deficient anemia. I mean, many of us have iron deficient anemia. Our hemoglobin matocrit slow because we don't get enough iron whether it's the way we eat um, usually, right? So iron deficient is usually due to nutrition problems. So how would we correct iron deficient anemia? There's two ways. I already said diet. The other way would be Giving them iron? Giving, yes, just giving them iron, as simple as that. Just giving them iron, as simple as that. Remember, the liquid does make their teeth turn brown. So getting it through a straw will prevent the teeth from being stained, okay? Also, it is absorbed into the body in their stomach. So stomach acid breaks it down to be usable, but they actually say to drink orange juice with it. And that helps it get better, you know, into the system a lot better. And remember, there always is iron dextram. It is a Z-track iron shot. Um, and some children need to go to that point in order to keep their iron levels high. Because in iron deficient anemia, you don't have enough hemoglobin. You don't have enough hemoglobin. There's no cells to carry oxygen around. There's no oxygen going around. They're going to be fatigued. Make sense? Okay, juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Well, what does that affect? What part of the body does JIA affect? Their joints. The body attacks the joints. Just like lupus attacks the organs, JIA attacks the joints. What might you, what you'd see in JIA? What are some symptoms that could bring you to JIA diagnosis? Difficulty ambulating, stiffness of the joints. Especially in the morning or after sitting for a while. Excellent, excellent. Now, what sort of therapy would really work well? You don't want to put these kids on barbells and weights. You're overstressing those joints. So that wouldn't be what you wanted. But how about a swimming pool? It's my favorite place. I've told you all that. It's very easy movement. You're exercising joints and it works well. So that will strengthen and um, you know make those joints all mobile and absolutely will make your you know those joints feel better. So JIA treatment and, and maybe going into methotrexate or into biologics like Humira, maybe infusions, you know, like a Remicade. I mean, there's all different things they can do. And NSAIDs is what they uh, choose for pain. They think that anti-inflammatory works the best with it. And then the care is to keep those joints mobile. Okay, another thing with, you know, we're talking about bolts and 
bones and joints. A child fell off the monkey bars, comes into the ER holding their left arm, you know, and telling you it hurts. What's the first thing you should do when you see a child with a possible broken bone? Their capillary refill? Neurovascular signs, absolutely. Because remember, it could be swelling, it could occlude blood vessels, and now you've got an emergency because now there's no blood going where it should go. That was excellent. So we're gonna put ice on it, stop the bleeding or, or the swelling in there, get that X-ray. Always remember with any broken bone, to make sure the child story and the parent story match because we always worry about child abuse, okay? And remember, infants, it's very difficult to break a bone, so always suspect. And yes, I've seen it, and it's not been a nice, pretty sight that I saw. Okay, Harrington rods. What are they used for? Anybody know what Harrington rods are used for? That's the rod they put on the spinal column to straighten it out with scoliosis. Remember that is the greater than 45 degree angle on the S-shaped spine. So they've got a rod down their back. How are you going to turn and position and maybe even put them on a bedpan? because they're in bed for a while until that really attaches and heals well. Are you gonna log roll them? We're gonna log roll them. Absolutely, good job. Yes, we're gonna log roll because we wanna keep that spine straight. We wanna keep those little attachments of that rod where it should be. Very good, yes. Okay, osteomyelitis. What do we know about you? What is it? bone infection? A bone infection, yes, as simply as that. And it is serious. So how do we treat it? Antibiotics. Antibiotics and usually long-term antibiotics. And many times it's IV antibiotics. Most bone infections are caused by staph infections. Staph infections are usually treated with the aminoglucosides like vancomycin IV. What do we know about the sins? These need peak and troughs because they're dangerous. What can they do? They can affect your hearing, cause deafness. It also can cause kidney damage. So we're watching urine output. Another thing with osteo, sometimes, They'll be staying at home and on bed rest because immobilizing the joint is part of the therapy. What diet would we put these children on? What aids in bone muscle healing? Vitamin D and C. And calcium. And calcium. Protein. High protein. High protein. High protein. High protein. High protein. Good. High protein. And those vitamins? Sure but high protein will help the muscles and the bones be able to heal best, okay? And um, sometimes we need to know if there is this osteo, is this child having a lot of infections so that we know how long we should put these children on and maybe watch out for other things because we don't know if they have osteo, it could be something else. Okay, cardiac, your favorite and mine. Well, my Professor favorite. Bogart. Yes. I had a question on that. Um, sure. When you mentioned about like the peak with the like giving bank IV, what, like how many doses after that do you check that? Do you recheck it? Usually it's after the third and before the fourth dose. That's all I've ever heard in my career. So okay. after the third dose, we do a trough. So after we get, you know, we'll, we'll do um, the, the peak right after and then a trough right before the fourth. So now we have a peak and trough. What does it measure? The peak is, is it enough drug in the body? The trough is, has enough been eliminated to the body or do I need to make the time longer between doses? 
I've seen it go from every 12 hours to every 36 hours, depending on how they're eliminating it. Because you can get toxic either on too much or giving doses too close together, okay? Did that help you understand that? Yes, thank you. Good, very good. Kawasaki disease. You know, Kawasaki disease, what, what are we going to see? What does a kid look like? Share a strawberry tongue. Yep. Conjunctivitis. Yeah, the or, big red eyeballs. Correct. Big red eyeballs. I mean, glow in the dark eyeballs. I mean, I my um, the cardiac, um, the charge of the cardiac unit, the doctor, son came in at age three with Kawasaki. And I still, to this day, remember the pink eyes that he came in with. It looked like he'd been rubbing his eyes forever and they were so red and glassy. Um, they could have a rash, um, fevers for sure. You know, it's usually peeling hands and uh, soles of feet and, and the palms of the hands, peeling cracked blisters type things. How do we treat Kawasaki? Aspirin. Yeah. Why do we give aspirin? Doesn't it thin the blood and prevent clots? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Very good. Yes. And what else do we treat it with? Inflammation. Well, that's the aspirin. It works on inflammation too. It's not a bacterial infection. So we give intravenous immunoglobins. It's gonna boost the body's own immune system to fight. Now, what are we most concerned about? Because remember, it's systemic vasculitis. What are we worried about the most? What vessels are we most concerned about in the body? The heart. The coronary arteries, yes because they could get little um, aneurysms on it. So we'll be doing an echocardiogram. That's your priority procedure on these children, okay? If they're admitted, they're usually an echo right up. We wanna see, we wanna be prepared what's going on. Prostaglandins is for a PDA, right? Now, what does the prostaglandins do to this patent ductus arteriosus? Doesn't it open something the or close something? The prostaglandins keeps the duct open. It needs prostaglandins <clears throat> to keep open. Mom, when she's pregnant, does it by herself. This is fetal circulation. But after birth and up to about 21 days, but it's usually pretty quick but it can go up to 21 days, is kept open. Now, indomethacin um, is what we use when it doesn't close, right? This is actually an IV NSAID. It's like an IV ibuprofen, believe it or not. It's an NSAID, it used to be used a lot for back injuries, like in the 80s, I mean, a while ago. And what it does, it blocks prostaglandins from going to that PDA or prostaglandins to be produced at all. So what happens? No prostaglandins, it's gonna close. And if we need to have prostaglandins on, because that's where oxygen comes from, it's from the pulmonary artery to the aorta. There are some conditions like the transposition of great arteries is a big one to think about. There's no oxygenation. You have systemic and you have your pulmonic and they're not, there's no connection. But that PDA puts that oxygen and it goes to systemic and it keeps the body um, oxygenized. Now, we give a little slow, continuous drip of a synthetic prostaglandins. Works really, really good. One of the things that can happen though with prostaglandins, number one, you can have a low grade fever, okay? And it can cause bradycardia. So maybe you need a less dose of prostaglandins, okay? Indomethacin, we usually give it in three doses. And um, I used to love giving indomethacin. They're usually, a lot of times, are um, babies born more prematurely that have these um, ducts that keep open. Now, how do you know 
the indomethacin is working without doing an echocardiogram. Well, that, <gasps> that duck has a really like washing machine type of murmur that you hear. And guess what? You're going to start not hearing it. And you're like, it's working. Now, there's another way you can tell if this PDA is closing. And that's when you look at the blood pressure. When you have an open duct, you're going to have blood pressure. It's going to be very wide pulse pressure. Could be 60 over 18 on a newborn. And when that duct closes, it'll go 60 over 40. You see that blood pressure, it gets a narrower pulse pressure. So that's prostaglandin to keep it open. Indomethacin closes it. So you have a congenital heart disease and they're not doing good. What are you going to see? So you have congenital heart disease. What do you know about congenital heart disease? Well, is their heart working good? Or is it working extra hard just to get oxygen around most of the time? What if you saw a heart rate starting to go down on these children and you see them tiring out and they're not able to eat? What would you be looking for? So the heart's not beeping, you know, pumping the blood around the way it should. And when it's not squeezing it and getting it around, blood can fill up and fluid into the lungs. And you might start seeing a child going into congestive heart failure. That is the tiring out during heart rate coming down. Their lungs are filling up and you need to check a blood pressure because probably your blood pressure, if heart's not working, you don't have a blood pressure either. You don't have a pulse, you don't have a blood pressure. And then you're going to see fluid building up. And, and that, would that cause would that cause our blood pressure to decrease as well? Like go down? Absolutely. Okay. Your blood okay. pressure will definitely go down. And because it's not functioning properly, fluid's going to build in lungs. Cardiac cath, what's the greatest risk with giving any any age person? Any. I mean, adults doesn't even matter. Adults to infants, what's the biggest um, problem? Yeah. Bleeding. 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 You know where they stick those catheters? They put it in the femoral artery and the femoral vein. It's one of the two biggest vessels in the body. And they puncture them and they put a catheter in there. And when they come out, they hold it. There's many different ways they do that. And when they hold it and it stops bleeding, they put a pressure dressing on it. And sometimes a sandbag if they're older children. But our biggest, biggest concern, cardiac calf is bleeding. What would you do if you saw that dressing getting saturated and you take it off and you see it bleeding? What do you do? Put pressure on it, but also call the doctor. Right. We put pressure above, like an inch above it, so we can still look at it. I mean, your heart's up here. The feet are here. This is where the holes are. You put it a little bit above and push down. And we're going to see if the blood stops coming out of the holes. And that's how we look at it. And yes, call for help. I mean, they're just going to give pressure. But how much blood was lost? And you need a doctor there in order to give those orders for those things. Very good. Remember, they're on bed rest for 24 hours. Yeah. Because you're worried about that clot. Digoxin administration. What do we know about giving digoxin? You need to check the heart rate first, to make sure they're not getting digoxicity. Right. So we need to know all levels of heart rate normals for children, right? What else do we check before we give digoxin? Potassium. Apical pulse. Apical pulse, potassium. And do we know? What is their dig level? What was the last recorded one? Okay. Now, what if you're an infant? You're given digoxin. The heart rate is borderline, but the baby just started vomiting. Isn't that a sign of digoxicity also? Yes. 
Yes. So we would hold it, call the doctor. Better be safe than sorry. It's not like, well, and you, you didn't know any better, nanny, nanny. No, remember, these are lives in your hand. If you have a suspicion, reach out on it, okay? Better safe than sorry. Rheumatic fever, what is it caused by? Strep. 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 Right, and we can correct everything. Remember, they get into that chorea, that little spastic arm and leg move movements, okay? And that usually is what the parents are most worried about. Um, it does go away with this long-term antibiotics treating the strep. And remember, valves, once they're damaged, they're damaged. They're going to need repaired or something watched. Urinary tract infections. Ah, oh, urinary. So now we're into GU. So urinary tract infections, how would you know a kid's having one? What did, they they what did you say what about, did you say about C? Frequent urination. Frequent urination, yes. It could be that urgency, frequency. Could be painful, could smell, right? Could be um, bedwetting at night, right? Enuresis. But enuresis could also be diabetes. Right? Yeah. So remember that. But if it's urinating at night with other symptoms, we know it's urinary tract infections. How can we decrease urinary tract infections in children? Cotton underwear. Yeah. Increase yes. fluids. Fluids, that's one of the most important things. Yes, yes. Limit bubble baths. Limit them, absolutely. They also say urinate right after a bubble bath. But don't kids get into the bath and urinate right away because it's warm? So how are they going to urinate again? I mean, that's just my mind thinking. But it, that they say that that could help. And no tight clothing, you know. You have, you have to let it breathe. And in males, pull back the foreskin and clean it. Minimum of once a day. Cryptoorchidism, what is that? Testes. It's when the, the testes, testes didn't descend. Yeah. They don't descend. They're still up in the abdominal cavity. Now remember, they can't live up there. It's too warm. You're gonna destroy the sperm. So when they get older, they're not going to be able to produce, you know, babies when they want to. So how do we examine for cryptoorchidism? In a warm environment, I'm sure it's warm. Because those testicles will sag, they'll hang more, okay? Men, if it's warm, the testicles hang more and they will be more possibility of being where they should be. If it's cold, they suck in. They try to keep them warm, okay? So that's what men do, hot and cold. So put them in a warm room. Another thing that's important to ask, sometimes when they get to the doctor's office, they don't see it, but you have definitely felt both of them. That is a great question for a nurse to ask. Have you ever felt both of them? Because it's usually unilateral. It's not usually both, okay? And they will do surgery and pull it out before one year if it's not out by itself because they don't want those testicles to heat up and cook inside the peritoneal cavity because they will, you know, destroy the purpose of them. Okay, we talked a little bit about vancomycin and we talked a little bit about hearing and urinary output. Remember, any child in a hospital long term on these sort of medicines, the immunoglucosides, when they're sent home, you need to tell the parents to make sure that they're hearing correctly and that they're still having wet diapers that are normal. Because remember, this is usually not at the beginning of the course. It's usually towards the end that we see it. And that's when we send the children home. Nephrotic syndrome, what is it? Is that kidney failure? No. no, this is not kidney failure. This is not acute. This is not chronic. This is not kidney failures. It's the kidney saying protein, bleh, I don't like you. And they urinate protein out. As simple as that. Okay. What does that do to the body? Well, the protein's gone. Well, protein albumin is where in the body? Intravascularly. 
What does that stuff do? Well, when you give medication, medications hop on board and it will work with the body. What's left in the blood, it's free drug. And that could be toxic. So we gotta be really careful when we're um, giving these children antibiotics. The doses have to be smaller than what you would think. Because you'll say, well, why are we only giving 125 milligrams? This kid's bigger. Well, it's because of the protein and the blood and the way that there's just free antibiotics, you know, floating in, which could cause damage. How do we worry about nephrotic syndrome? Remember the retaining fluid because no protein, the blood and the, 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 um, the intravascular space goes interstitially trying to get this isotonic. They don't like it that it's hypotonic inside the intravascular space because no protein. So it gets sucked up in, interstitially. These kids come in with big, round, puffy eyes, tongue, cheeks, you know, and you'll see them edematous. So anything that has to do with fluid, what is your nursing priority? What are you going to watch really close? Anything with fluid. Daily weights. Daily weights and take Daily, output. I was about to say weight gain. Also, remember salt restriction and fluid restriction and this will be for life they actually do treat that with um steroids and it usually puts them back now sometimes we decide just to give some of that iv albumin you know they have five percent and they have 25 percent albumin and sometimes we just want to and albumin is protein it's the same name all right albumin is protein protein is albumin they give it interstitially it's an infusion and what they're doing is they're trying to suck out that fluid interstitially and go intervascularly. How do you know it's working? We're sucking all the fluid out and putting it intervascularly. What are you gonna see? The weight are improving. Well, you're gonna see the edema going away, but I think the first thing you're gonna see is they're gonna be urinating a lot. Increased urine output. It's going to increase because now you suck fluid out, you have more fluid intervascularly, and it's going to come out. Hypospadias, how do we treat this? What is this? Hypospadias. Surgery, surgery using the foreskin of right. the penis. Yes. And literally that penis is filleted in half. They open it up. They create a canal that goes now from, you know, the, the bladder goes up to the end of the penis, not underneath or on top, epispadius. And they put a little catheter in there, okay? It looks almost like a female straight catheter. And you've probably seen those in your labs doing straight cats practice. It's a little tiny little eight French thing. And they'll put it in there and... We don't touch it. We do nothing to it. We keep it inside the diaper, okay? And that allows the lumen of the penis to be able to heal, and then it will make the penis urinate in the proper manner. When do we want to do these repairs by? Little boys born. Isn't it two to three months? Potty train. Before they're potty trained, before they're potty trained. We don't have to do it quick. It doesn't have to be done right away. It's before potty training so that they know it's coming out the end. Okay, very good. Wilms tumor, what's the big red, you know, alert? What don't do you not do? Touch. With do not pop it. Right. And also, if this, you know, we, we've talked about a lot of cancers and we talked about treatment is biopsy, radiation, chemotherapy, surgery, right? We do no biopsy on a Wilms tumor because sticking something in there is doing what? It's releasing metastasis into peritoneal cavity, okay? That's the thing that um, you should be aware of. And yeah, don't touch it, leave it alone. Chronic kidney disease, you know, we worry about a lot of things, erythropoietin and calcium and vitamins, right? And the kidneys, uh, remember all of those things affect uh, both uh, your bone growth, whether one's shorter, longer, crooked, um, and we need to be aware of it. So we would give those supplements, erythropoietin. Why do we give erythropoietin? What does that do? 
create red blood cells? It creates red blood cells. Yes, it does, because the kidneys can't do it. So absolutely, erythropoietin, um, they give that and the calcium and vitamins just to try to keep those bones healthy as they grow. Glomerulonephritis is the other strep, right? This is another one that um, just like your rheumatic fever and it is treated just like strep. So you have a child come in, a little boy and he's holding his left testicle and saying, I'm in pain. Um, what is that? What could it be? What sort of priority is this? Is this probably a torsion maybe? Maybe it twisted. So it is an emergency. I know in the emergency room where I worked for 10 years, you get a testicular pain, they're reported immediately because you have to save the testicle. And if it's twisted, it's not getting any sort of oxygen and it can die. And we don't want to do that to any young child. Okay, respiratory, epiglottitis. What do you see with epiglottitis? Key things that you see. The one with the drooling? Yes. So epiglottitis is croup left untreated, swells up the rest of the oropharynx and the epiglottis swells. And that's that thing that covers the trachea when you swallow. So food don't go in there. So the trachea, your air pipe, your windpipe, where oxygen goes in and out, there's no space to breathe in and out. Now, you can get air in, barely. Out, you can push it out but getting it in. So you're going to hear that inspiratory problems with this here. And it's this swelling and you can't swallow garbled voice. These kids almost look at hypoxic, they'll get irritable, they'll get restless. Remember, this is an emergency. You need to have a trach tray and an intubation tray at bedside because they could need it if we don't get that swelling down pretty quick. Most likely this child's gonna get an epi aerosol right away, maybe even epinephrine sub Q, um, steroids, IV started, cause they can't eat or drink, it's airway compromise. Why do we use spacers for asthma? The children that are not clearly, probably don't use it properly, younger what? children. Very much so. Sometimes you have children that come in and, you know, they don't have many asthma attacks, you know, but they had one and they've been using it and they get worse and worse. Well, if it's just an MDI, you know, it's to push and inhale at the same time. I mean, chewing gum and walking, some people can't do it, right? So we put it in that little spacer. We put the whatever, two puffs usually. Child breathes out five times and we know that the child's gotten it. You know, little children cry when you do it, but they take a deep breath when they cry. So we know they're getting the medicine. So it works. Croup, what are we going to teach these children, these parents, these children about emergencies following it? So we got a swollen oral pharynx, okay? You have this barking going on, right? So this is the child that again, we're worried about progression to epiglottitis, right? So if we have pro starting to progress there, they cannot swallow secretions. They need to get to the ER immediately. Call 911, okay? Something's going on. And again, that racemic epi aerosol, again, goes right to the area. And it's just like giving an epi shot. It's a, it'll start all, stop all the inflammation like an anaphylaxis type thing, okay? RSV, what is RSV? A respiratory infection. Virus. It's a virus, it's a virus, okay? And for me and you, it's a common cold. But a little baby has to suck, swallow, and breathe. And that in itself is a big chore. So put mucus in the nose. How do infants breathe? Through their nose. Through their nose. It's called an obligatory nose breather. So they can't breathe. So suction the nose out and you can let them, you know, drink. Now, some children, normal kids, healthy, they can tolerate it and they do well. 
well, what if you already have a child with cystic fibrosis or you have a child with congenital heart disease or premature and is already on oxygen, premature infant? These children need to be protected. Synergist, tell me what you know about it. Synergist, what is it for? How do you give it? When do you give it? <clears throat> Even once a month through injection between, I don't remember what month, September through April. That's Winter about right. To That's absolutely. And it's once a month. Very good. It prevents RSV and those children that it could be a really dangerous situation. Excellent. Good job. All right. Tell me, an infant, when do you know they're in severe respiratory distress? What signs and symptoms are the ones you have to be the most concerned about? Flurry nasals, nasal, the nasal flare. Nasal flare. Grunting. Grunting. Huge, yes. Retractions, abdominal breathing, you know, and... You know, they don't necessarily tell you that they're getting, you know, confused. Uh, they don't show it. They might be restless, but you don't really see it. But infants, you see those nasal uh, flaring and you hear that eh, 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 on every breath. That child, that infant's about to go and respiratory collapse. They're, they're going to stop breathing on you. And of course, you'll see all the retractions, intercostal, supraclavicular, um, and we need to treat that immediately. And sometimes you got to just pick them up, you know, they're laying down. I mean, pick them up, at least open their diaphragm, drop it down, and then we'll do the aerosols, whatever we need. So cystic fibrosis, why do we give chest CVT? And why do we give enzymes? Why? What cystic fibrosis have to do with that? Mm -hmm. Cystic fibrosis, cystic fibrosis is, twofold. is twofold. We have it yeah, in the cool. lungs and we have it in the small intestines. It's all mucus building up there. In the lungs, these lungs are full of mucus. It's like this big petri dish that gets thick. And it grows bacteria and multiple, multiple infections will occur unless we can aggressively treat it and remove that mucus. Aggressive chest physical therapy. They use the chest vest, they use aerosols, they will give even antibiotic aerosols, everything. They have chronic pneumonias and upper respiratory infections. Now, why the enzymes? Well, the body has an inability to digest food. So we give, usually it's pancreatase is the name of it. And we give it immediately before meals and snacks. And this will help with the digestion. Remember, they lose a lot of fat vitamins. Okay. And those fat vitamins, they come out in the stool. And uh, we need to be careful with fat on these children because they'll get this bloating that goes on with it. Um, but we really need to give them some good carbohydrates and proteins, you know, just to keep them healthy nutrition wise, right? And then replace the vitamins. So we have lungs and small intestines. And remember, albuterol is your rescue when you have difficulty breathing because it tries to open up the lungs where they're trying to close down and not breathe. So, okay, let's go to GI now. Diarrhea. Well, diarrhea, we know that's a loss of a lot of alkaline because all of your enzymes are all alkaline. So we're losing that. It's like an acid. It burns. We're going to do number one, we'll be checking. How does the rectum look? How does that area look? It could be all burnt down. We might need to treat that. That poor kid is burning. You know, and older kids won't tell you. They're shy. They're like, ooh, you know, remember, older children, those preschoolers, school age, a lot of them won't tell you, you know, that they burn down there um, because they're embarrassed. Um, also, they're afraid you're going to do something that hurts, okay? just like injections. They don't want pain medicine because the injections, it might hurt. 
right? So we need to tell them that, no, we're not giving you a shot. It's going through the IV. Or here's some cream. You can put it on your butt, make you feel better. And when you say it like that, the kids usually giggle and they'll say, okay. I said, let me look, make sure you did it okay. How do we treat diarrhea? Fluid. How do we give fluids? IV. Do we have to give it oral. IV? Do we have to give it IV? Can do oral. We can give it oral. Gatorade. Gatorade. Gatorade, Powerade, whatever the aid is you have there. Yes, electrolyte solution of some sort. Um, unless they're, you know, getting confused and, and they cannot physically unable to drink. But usually diarrhea, we just give them oral and we start to feed them, okay? Because then it's something that will make this tool substantial, okay? A lot of times, this is not in your books, but you give lactobacillus. It helps replace the floor and it does help. All right, abdominal pain. Get a kid, come into the doctor's office and they say, my tummy hurts. What's your first question you're gonna ask? Kid has abdominal pain. Where does it hurt? And where? What? Is it the right lower quadrant? Is this a surgical emergency or is this just heartburn? Is it right there, you know, in your mid abdomen on your belly button, which could be just, you know, gas, could be, you know, the tummy, something they ate, or they're just about to get diarrhea, right? So where it's at, very important. All right, so you've had a kid who's gone through surgery, okay? And um, all of a sudden, they develop this severe colicky abdominal pain. Remember, one of the things you need to remember to check after abdominal surgeries on children is stools and passing gas. You listen to the bowel sounds, making sure the acid, the gas and everything continue to move because you realize when they open up the peritoneal cavity, the intestines stop peristalsis. Did you know that? It stops. So why do we do out of bed walking and drinking fluids, coughing, deep breathing? Well, that's lungs, but it's also trying to get those intestines to move again. Many a times with all this manipulation that they've done, they could have had to have gone to the back of the, into the, the kidneys, which is through all of those intestines, it could cause a paralytic alias. Know the signs and symptoms, and that's just a tense abdominal pain, a nausea, vomiting, because they're not working, and um, it's, it's very painful. Actually, usually treatment is a, an NG tube down these children, an NPO, you know, and wait for them to start getting their um, GI tract moving again. Pyloric stenosis, what is the big symptom of that? Projectile vomiting. Projectile vomiting. It's not the dribble, it's across the room, ages three weeks to usually not more than three months. And the big thing is projectile vomiting. So they've come in, they're, you're an ER nurse, they've come in, this infant, you've asked, they're projectile vomiting, we're gonna make them NPO, right? Because why? They're just going to vomit again. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, vomiting always causes what? Possibility of dehydration. Send them over for their little ultrasound. And um, you're going to put your hand up underneath their little um, sci-fi process right in that area. You're going to feel that little olive or that little um, marble, as I call it. And that will be IV, NPO, get them going. And usually the next day, a little bit of Tylenol for pain, um, start the fluid slowly. And these kids usually are home within 24 hours. They do well. Intussusception, what's the big signs that you see with intussusception that you should check for? Well, you know, projectile vomiting, pyloric stenosis. Intussusception, what do you see? That ribbon light, ribbon light, that ribbon light stool. No, but jelly that's her Oh, sorry, sorry. Jelly. This, this is the current jelly and a little bit of blood in it. Mm -hmm. Current jelly. Because remember, it squeezes, so stool can't come. So it's just a little bit of the jelly stool stuff that's in the intestines and a little bit of blood. That's what you see. So um, again, these children go for an ultrasound. If they all of a sudden pass the stool, 
guess what? The intestines are working. Call the doctor. Say, no, we don't have to do surgery. You don't do anything. They've already doing okay. Reflux on children as they get older. Remember, we treat it with diet bland foods. Of course, we'll put them on something like an antacid, like a Zantac, Pepsid. Um, those are the first things we do. And what would you do for that child that medically we can't do anything? And we have to do a surgical procedure because they're burning, burning, they're coughing, they're having all these mini aspirations. How are we going to um, treat that surgically? What's the name of that procedure? Do you remember it? It's the Nissan fun, something with an F. Fungal plication. Yes, very good. Remember, we use that also when we put in G-tubes because we don't want that fluid to go up because we get big boluses of fluid down there. So they always do a G-tube with fundal plication. But that would be the most extreme and surgical thing that we would do if we're a child that has reflux that we can't treat with everything and everything's being done. What do you see with symptoms of jaundice Glare is turning a little yellow, tea colored urine, stools are pale. This is a newborn infant, young infant. What would you suspect? Jaundice. What is jaundice? Where does that come from? It comes from the liver. What would be a problem with the liver? And your sclera are yellow. That means that bile from the liver is going systemic. What's going on? It's getting into the kidneys now. Now, it's not going into the stools because now they're pale. They don't have bile in it. Filillary atresia. Do you see how I just broke that all down for you? Look at the symptoms they gave you and break it down. It's all pointed to the liver. That means liver's not going where it should. So there's a stenosis, there's an atresia, there's a something going on. So your school nurse, and you have this kid comes in, complaining, my ears are ringing, it's driving me crazy. What should you do first? Uh, look at other ears. You gotta look in their ear. You know, I've told my students, I've actually seen cockroaches inside ears. So it may not just be a hearing issue, may not just be loud music that's going in there. There could be something in there. And that, actually that cockroach was alive. We put mineral oil in there. We warmed it up, put it in there, and it floated and we pulled it out. And it was gross. Huh. You know, this doing this at three o'clock in the morning was not nice. But that poor kid was like, get it out, get it out. Anyway, meningitis. You have a child coming in with all the symptoms. You know, the stiff neck. We have the headaches. We have, you know, light sensitivity, fever. What do you know you're going to do for this child? What exam? No, actually, that's to diagnose. Is it viral or is it bacterial? A lumbar puncture. It is. It is a lumbar puncture. What do you see with a lumbar puncture on a bacterial meningitis specimen? Well, it's bacterial. So we're going to see white blood cells, right? Bacteria, white blood cells. And then the other thing we actually see is elevated proteins and low glucose because bacteria love sugar. And, um, and it would be milky looking. On a viral, they're clear, absolutely clear. So that's how you know almost immediately what you're dealing with as a nurse. Seizures, remember it's all about safety. We've gone over this a hundred times. We turn them over to the side. We take out all the toys, keep them safe. You know, put the head of the bed down and pat the side rails if we can. Watch what's going on so you can document all of this and of course call for help. Myelomeningocele, what is a myelomeningocele? Yes. I know the mm, spine of the it's something sticking <laughs> out of the bottom of the spine at birth. How does that sound? Makes it easy, doesn't it? And it's meninges and it's spinal 
nerves and cord and it's pulled and ripped some of those nerves. So you can see there's gonna be neuro deficits on the lower extremities of some sort. So that being said, what's our concerns? Well, you see one of them here. Sometimes they don't feel their bladder getting big. They don't feel that they have to go and urinate because the nerves are not telling them. These children will end up with lifelong catheterizations every four hours. It's just what happens. Remember, anything that they're born on the outside, the spina bifida, the myelomeningocils, they're all the same. Latex allergies uh, will always be something we put up uh, so that they don't, um, you know, actually to develop them because of the manipulation that these children get. Remember, the other concern with myelomeningocils is uh, constipation. Again, they don't feel stool. Duchenne muscular dystrophy. What do you know about Duchenne muscular dystrophy? What is that? Muscle wasting. Muscle wasting, yes. And we usually find that on a kid ages three to six or seven boys. And it comes from mom, X, X link, right? How do we treat this? How do we find it out? EMG. Right. And what are we going to be tell these parents about with this EMG after it's done? It will hurt. It can hurt. Yes, it can for sure. So Tylenol, Motrin, something will need to be given for them. Good. If they want more children, remember, you know, genetics, because uh, it does come from mom. So you have a kid outside playing and he fell in the tree, pine cones, his eyes are scratched. He's got the pine needles all over, you know, and he's got injuries. Uh, one of the things with injuries, what we have to be concerned about is protecting those eyes. Um, and get treatment. So remember, it's those Fox shields. We're gonna patch both eyes and get them to medical attention as soon as we can. Okay, that's the big thing. Anything sticking out, leave it there. Nice stigmas. What are you gonna check? Does everybody know, remember the six cardinal positions of gaze? So this is when your eyes are moving and you're know, not focusing correctly. We just went over some hydrocephalus earlier um, about the head circumference getting bigger and um, checking fontanelles, okay? Um, be something we look at. When a child has hydrocephalus, we will be doing what we call a ventricular peritoneal shunt. Ventricular peritoneal shunt drains that fluid, right? Keeps the head from getting too big, prevents headaches. Fluid in the head, extra pressure in the head causes vomiting and headaches, right? So a child came in complaining of headache and vomiting. One of the things we'll do is we'll do an x-ray. We'll be checking that ventricular peritoneal shunt. Is it where it should be? And how do we know that revision worked? They sent a surgery. How do you know that, that revision now works? Headache and vomiting stops, they feel better. As simple as that, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, endocrine. I mean, I think I've really um, emphasized the point, why do we do height and weight every visit on all the children? Well, it's for many reasons, could be fluid balances, but it also could be endocrine. And we know that there's hypo, hyperpituitarism, and all affects growth, so again, that's how we detect it and detect it early, height and weight. Children have to go in for normal, you know, immunizations, normal annual exams, you know, so they're always being checked. And that's one way that we can keep a track of if there's any issues, hormone or any other problem. It could even just be nutrition, right? Hypoparathyroid. What does the parathyroid regulate? Calcium. Calcium. What does calcium affect? Calcium, magnesium. They're about the same, right? It's all about the muscle. Your heart's a muscle. Your diaphragm's a muscle, right? So we could see just muscle weakness, cramping. 
So we could see too much, too little by, you know, not enough means, you know, you're more flaccid, okay? When you have hyper, you're gonna have that tetany, that contraction um, type of muscle. So we'll know it's elevated. Usually they'll do surgery to take it out if it's too much. Diabetic ketoacidosis. Uh, what do we do first with DKA? Give fluid and insulin. Fluid, and then we'll put them on a regular <laughs> insulin drip, and then we'll be adjusting it, okay? What's the difference between diabetes and DKA? Ah. Ketones in the urine. Excellent. Very good. Absolutely. That's the difference. Because you can have high blood sugars and not be DKA. It could just be high blood sugar. But when you see the ketones, that's when you see it. Very good. One thing about children, remember, we want kids to be normal, right? We want them to be out. We want them to play. So remember, um, they need to be prepared for sports. And how would they be prepared to go out and play, let's say, a game of soccer? Because they can play it. What do they need to do? That child with type 1 diabetes, what should be done and why and how should they be prepared for that? Eat before they played? Absolutely. I check their blood sugar. Where is it before they play? And have snacks. And remember, hydration is also key on diabetes. So make sure they're drinking, make sure they have a snack, make sure they check their blood sugar before they start. That keeps a child safe. So what would you teach this child about hypoglycemia? What are the signs of it? And they're right here. It's the sweaty, shaky, nauseous. It's a terrible feeling, you know, and they just feel weak. And if they have their snacks, they have their drinks, guess what? We can get those up um, very quickly. If it's in the hospital, you have a, an infant, not an infant, a child who's, you know, you walk in and they're sweaty and shaking and I don't feel good. Well, give them a grand crapper, give them milk, give them some orange juice, all those things work. What are the thyroid hormones that we use? That when we're checking thyroid, what are we going to be checking? What are those lab value names? T4 and T3. And TSH, right? Now remember, when the TSH is high, T4 is low. And when the T4 is high, TSH is low. They're converse to each other. For some reason, I like to pick on a question with TSH. I'm not even sure why. But as long as you know that, I think it can answer the question because I don't know what questions are but I can tell you the information. I think that would be beneficial. If you had an adolescent whose BMI, let's say it's 95%, what would you suspect with that? Diabetes. You could, yes. So you're definitely gonna do a hemoglobin A1C or a blood sugar right away. Let's see what's going on. Cause that could be the sign and they just don't know it yet. Cause you know, that's all that sugar that's sitting there. All right, common childhood diseases impentago impentago my grandson had it it was a scratch on the back of his knee and it got infected and it's usually staph skin is usually staph how do we treat it we put great you know i'm talk not over the counter but prescribed antibiotics uh bactroban is is the one that you usually use and oral antibiotics and that's usually cephalexin. If you ever have to give it to your kid, remember that causes diarrhea. So give a uh, lactobacillus with it because it will. And remember the key thing with epintigo, do not pop those lesions. And it could leave like a pink discoloration of the skin when it's done that you'll see it there and you know, slowly fade out, but it could take a couple of years. Conjunctivitis, you know, we give eye ointments, it's infectious. Um, what should we warn a child about giving an ointment into an eye? What would be that big concern? Hmm. It can cause irritation. Can you, can you imagine all of a sudden nobody tells you they put this ointment in and you're blinking and you can't see? Mm -hmm. I'm blind, I'm blind, I can't see. So yeah, tell them that, you know, it's going to blur their vision, it's normal. 
usually we don't do them until nighttime. We'll put in the um, ointments at night. Ticks, they love questions on ticks. Remember ticks has to do with being out in a field uh, next to a lake, uh, tall grass uh, in a forest, the woods. Um, of course, they try to protect themselves with, you know, long sleeves, collars, and long pants, but it still can happen. So how do you, um, if you're suspecting a tick, what should you do? Pull it off and then go to the doctor. Well, yeah, you can pull it off. Absolutely. Go to the doctor, let them know about it. Um, and, and then the one thing we do is, you know, uh, my daughter's uh, friend calls up and says, you know, my daughter has ticks. What are you going to do to your? Well, just take their clothes off and look, see if there's ticks anywhere. First thing is the inspection, then pull it out and then get to the doctor to see if there's any other treatment or making sure you got that tick out. Tetanus, remember that's lockjaw and that hurts, okay? So first thing with tetanus, what do you do? You stepped on a nail, you know, just a good old step on a nail. Wash rinse soap and water. And put an antibiotic ointment if you have one at home. And that actually should have a booster, right? Make mm -hmm. sure that at least they have the one tetanus, but they usually will get a booster. Very good. Chicken pox. When are they contagious? Two days before the rash shows up. Yes, yes. And then they are all the way till all the lesions are crusted. Whenever their lesions are open and juicy, that's an infected child. Head lice, how do you know you have it? My kid's itching like crazy, right? My kids had it five times in elementary school. I could have killed them. Where are you getting his head lice from? I was so tired of washing clothes and linens and blankets and vacuuming and um, putting this medicine, right? Nix, whatever it is. Remember, inspect the hair follicles and it takes a fine comb and getting them out, um, which will help prevent them, you know, to, to get rid of it. So otitis media, well, we know the ears of the ear, eustachian tubes, back of the throat. How do we uh, decrease the amount of occurrence of otitis media? Keep them from swimming pools. It's an infant. You know, as simple as keeping them away from smoke, secondhand smoke. And don't lay them down while they're feeding, have their head up so they're not pooling the formula or breast milk in the back, which will go up to their short, open, wide eustachian tubes. So sit them up taller, okay? And no smoking around them. So yell at your uncle for smoking in the house. Get out now. ADHD, how do we treat it? Attention deficit. With therapy or medication? There are medications and it's, you know, actually it speeds you up medicine is what works on them, like the Adderall, it speeds them up. And it's because they're already speeded, it actually calms them down, which I think is wild, but that's what is. And then get them on a schedule, routine, schedule. Now they know what's coming next. They don't have to think because they, how do you know a kid is ADHD? They start something, start something, start something, start something, and they don't finish a thing. So on a routine, many parents will have a list of things that they're going to do, and they check it off as they go, and it keeps them organized. It makes them feel better. We know about nosebleeds. Now, infectious disease, we're almost done, guys. Thanks for being so patient. Um, a lot of information here. So infectious disease. A low neutrophil count, I don't care what their low neutrophil count from, whether it's cancer, whether it's, it doesn't matter. You see any person, child, infant, even your adult, you have a child with neutrophil count of less 500. What is your concern there? What does neutrophil counts mean? Infection. What it's telling you, it's like having a low white count, which means you don't have an immune system. 
So if you're giving a list of patients, who are you going to see first? Okay, this is a question often in an exam. If you have a patient that, you know, list of patients, who are you going to see first? A child, whatever age, for whatever reason they're in, with a temperature, with a neutrophil count of four or 500, that's your priority. Because these children could go into septic shock quickly. So that will be your priority. They don't have an immune system. Remember, hand washing is the big deal. Remember, proper equipment. There you are. All of a sudden, you were gone. I waited for you guys. I still need to share the screen again. Okay, I figured it out. Thanks, guys. All right. So remember, immunosuppressed is any sort of child. Children, infants, are getting immunizations like crazy, right? I mean, what is it? Four injections of two, four, six months? I mean, that's a lot. And it goes into those vastus lateris, into the thighs. And that's a lot of stuff that's creating a stir in the immune system to boost it so they can build their own antigens. Remember, pedaling their legs afterwards helps move it around. Also, cold pack. And... Tylenol for children less than six months, and you may give Motrin only after they're six months old. So no Motrin on any infant unless they're six months old. And then there's usually four questions on acid base on every HESI I've ever seen. So I've put down the four different types of examples for you to know. Hyperventilation is respiratory alkalosis, Diarrhea, because you're losing alkaline from the stool, it's the opposite, acidosis, metabolic acidosis. Vomiting, they're vomiting acid. So it's metabolic, what's left? Alkalosis. And remember what Kuzmol does. Kuzmol respirations in DKA. This patient is in metabolic acidosis. We know that. Their pHs are 6.9 sometimes, okay? That's really acid. So those lungs say, let me try. So they go into respiratory alkalosis trying to work up for it. Any questions? Your dosage calc are basically simple on these HESIs. It's more like given a dose and the pharmacy sends this, how much do you give? Or is how many micrograms per kilogram are you going to give? There's not anything sophisticated, mics per kilo, et cetera, et cetera. I've not seen them, okay, as far as what I've been told about them. So I wish you all good. You let me all know how you did on your HESIs. I wish you all the best. I mean, yeah, I've taken up almost two hours of your time, but I don't mind if you all do well. So good luck, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Good luck. Go Thank get you. them, Tigers. You could do yeah. this. Thank you. You're welcome. I'll post it soon. <laughs>